Hi guys, how are you doing? Due to some issues, I did not make any video, so sorry for that. Now, moving to our video. So, our today's topic is lifting of corporate veil. One of the main characteristics feature of a company is that the company is a separate legal entity distinct from its members. The most illustrative case in this regard is the case decided by the House of Lords in Salomon versus a Salomon and Company Limited. And I have already explained this case. So, if you have not seen it, please see that video first so the concepts are more clear to you. As we know that people started using the veil of corporate personality blindly as a clock for fraud or improper conduct. Thus, it become necessary for the courts to break through or lift the corporate veil. That is, not consider the company as distinct entity and look at the persons behind the company who are the real beneficiaries and do frauds and hide behind the name of the company. Now, the veil can be lifted in two ways. First, the statutory provisions and second through judicial interpretations. Statutory provisions include section 2 clause 60, 3a, 7 subsection 7, 39 subsection 3, 251, 339, 448, 449 and many more. Judicial interpretations includes Fraud or improper conduct, benefit of revenue, against public policy, trust or agency, enemy character, unjust and inequitable manner. First, we will talk about judicial interpretation. First, fraud or improper conduct. This judgment was given in the case of Jones v. Lipman which is already explained in my previous video in detail. So if you have not seen it, then you can see by clicking on the i button. Second, for the benefit of revenue. This was decided in the case of Dinshaw Manikji Pettit. And I'm sorry if, if my pronunciation is wrong, just ignore it. Hello Dinsha sir, nice to meet you. Please sit. Hello. Nice to meet you too. Sir is there any problem? Why have you called me? I know you are a good lawyer, so I needed your advice on tax matters. Sure sir. As I am earning a good amount of money through dividend and interest, there has been a good amount of tax as well, can you suggest some good ideas to ignore such taxation? Sir, you can form company in which you can transfer some of your income. Actually, I have a better idea. Sir, you can form four private companies, in which you can invest your income, which shall be credited to the company's account, and later will be given to you as a pretended loan. In this way, you can reduce your tax liability. I think this is a good idea. It was then challenged in the court of the law that the company was just made to evade the taxes. Sir, the assessee formed four private companies which I will call family companies for convenience of reference, although in fact no other member of his family took any direct benefit to render. The names of these four companies were Petty Limited, the Bombay Investment Company Limited, the Miscellaneous Investment Limited, and the Safe Securities Limited. Each of these companies took over a particular block of investments belonging to the assessee. The schedule showed that of these 498 shares, 254 stood in his name and 200 in the name of his wife, and the rest in the names of some 13 other nominees. The 498 shares remain as they were in the safe hands of the assessee or his nominees. So does the income also. Sir, 
but the company is a distinct entity distinct from its members even if they are from the same family. As refers from the case of Salomon vs. Salomon and Company Limited. Sir, the company did not indulge in any active business, as in the case of Salomon it was doing its business, which eventually does not end well. On the other hand, the fact that the family company has paid tax, on the interest credited to it by the assessee, in respect of the alleged loans, does not necessarily involve the conclusion that the loans were genuine, nor stop the Crown from now showing that these loans were illusory. Paying tax on the alleged interest arising from the loan was much cheaper for the assessee than paying super tax on the dividends themselves. This clearly shows that these companies are sham and merely formed to evade taxes. In this case the assessee was receiving under the guise of loans or advances the profits which were made by the company, which he controlled, and in which he held all the shares, except three which were held by his subordinates. The company was created by him merely, so that he could make entries in the company's books, suggesting that it received the interest and dividends and paid them as loans, whilst in reality the receipt of dividends and interest, if it could be called the business of the company, was its only business and was in fact the business of the assessee himself. So, the corporate veil shall be lifted. In this way, the corporate veil was lifted. So, moving to the next one. Third, enemy character. A company may assume an enemy character when persons in de facto control of its affair are residents in an enemy country. In such a case, the court may examine the character of the person in real control of the company and declare the company to be an enemy company. It was held in the case of Delmer Company Limited versus Continental Tire and Rubber Company Limited. During the First World War. Good morning, ma'am. Do you call me? Yes. What happened with the Daimler Company's payment? Ma'am, we have not received payment till now. And now since the war has broke it can be delayed more. Then issue a proper notice to them for the payment, and now since the war has begun, trading with England and getting finance will not only help Germany, but also will make the resources of England lesser. Yes, ma'am, it will be taken care of. Sir, Continental Tire and Rubber Company has issued notice for the payment. Then why the payment have not been issued? Sir, although the company is incorporated in England but, all except one of Continental Tire and Rubber Company Limited's shares are held by German residents and all directors are German residents. The secretary is English. I am concerned that, making payment might contravene a common law, offense, of trading with the enemy as well as a Proclamation issued under Section 3. 1. Trading with the Enemy Act 1914. Then what should we do now? Sir, we can bring action in the court, to determine whether the payment could be made in this situation or not. In this way, the company cannot sue us for the payment. Our reputation will not be in stake and we would also know whether it is right or not to pay them. Okay then do it. In times of war, the court may lift the corporate veil and look at the nationality of its members and director to determine if the company is to be classified as enemy. If the members and de facto control of the company's affair are the residents in an enemy country the company may be classified as enemy. 4. Agency or Trust Where a company is acting as agent for its shareholder, the shareholders will be liable for the acts of the company. It is a question of fact in each case whether the company is acting as an agent for its shareholders. There may be an express agreement to this effect or an agreement may be implied from the circumstances of each particular case.
I love you. Will you marry me? Yes. Cut. The scene is done and movie is complete. Sir, but why can't you register this name for the movie? Although this is in British company, but the American company has financed the production of this film. Since 90% of the capital is held by American company I cannot register this film as British film. You cannot do this. I will see you in court. It was held that, the decision was valid in view of the fact that British company acted merely as he nominee of the American company. Fifth, Avoidance of Welfare Legislation Avoidance of welfare legislation is as common as avoidance of taxation and the approach of the courts in considering problems arising out of such avoidance is generally the same as avoidance of taxation. It is the duty of the courts in every case where the ingenuity is expended to avoid welfare legislation to get behind the smoke screen and discover the true state of affairs. And last, six, public interest. The court may lift the way to protect public policy and prevent transactions contrary to public policy. The court will rely on the ground when lifting the veil is the most just result, but there are no specific grounds for lifting the corporate veil. Thus, where there is a conflict with public policy, the court ignores the form and takes into account the substance. Now we will move to the statutory provisions. First, Section 2, Clause 60 of the Companies Act defines the individual person committing a wrong or an illegal act to be held liable in respect of offences as Officer in Default This section gives a list of officers who shall be liable to punishment or penalty which shall include the managing directors, company secretary, etc. Second, Section 3A. This section provides that if the members of the company is reduced below 7 in case of public company and 2 in case of private company and the company continues to carry on the business for more than six months while the number is so reduced. Every person who knows this fact and is a member of the company is severally liable for the debts of the company contracted during that time. Third, Section 339 of the Act In case of winding up of company, it is found that the company's name was used for carrying out a fraudulent activity. The court is empowered to hold any such person be liable for such unlawful activities, be it director, manager or any other officer of the company. And there are many more sections in which the veil can be lifted, but I cannot discuss all the sections here. This is all for today. Thank you guys. Hope you got all the concepts and the case laws and also like this video.